So, um, so I work in a company that is super digital. In my company, we have M2M everywhere. We have a big ERP. It's the most digital company you can imagine. We've done everything right. As a matter of fact, Laurent also works at a company that is fully digital, has M2M and has an ERP, and he's done everything right. Like, he won a prize last year for being the most digital company in France. Now, if my company orders something from Laurent's company, my secretary will write an email to Laurent's secretary, or mail secretary, whatever you want. And, and uh, it is digital because it's an email, but in a way it's really not digital because really there's humans involved. And now carefully observe what a, human, what a human does in placing an order. As somebody sitting in front of, a, of their two screens, on one screen they have their own ERP with highly structured data and forms, and from this they write a flat email. Dear Laurent's secretary, I would like to order. And on the other end, there's Laurent's secretary who also has two screens. On one, she has her email. On the other one, she has her own highly structured ERP system with all the, 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 all the various data fields. And then she's reading this email and filling out her own, um, uh, her own highly uh, structured uh, data system. Okay. Now, and the question is, why secretary? Because really, uh, all the way in the beginning, we have highly structured data here, and we have highly structured data there, and, and the data just goes through a flat email at some point to then be restructured. Why, why don't these two systems talk directly to each other? And, and this is interoperability. You want, you want systems across company, across company um, uh, borders to talk to each other. My company, your company, uh, fully automized IT systems. Now, you can always hook up two IT systems. Uh, you, you get a consultant, some little coder. He can always connect your system and my system, I'm sure. But you don't want to just do business with me. You want to do business with the next 10,000 people or more. Or even if it's just your printers, it might be like 50. And you don't want to do 50, 50 uh, times your own special development. And any, any IT development, by the way, it's sort of like fathering a child, which means alimony and problems for the next 18 years. So, so if we code an IT system together, every time something changes, we have to put resources into updating this. So really all you want is you're like, guys, why, why don't we standardize? Why don't we standardize how this, is, how this communicates? And, and this is, we're talking standardization here, not like XML, uh, which is uh, sort of uh, tech level, but we're talking application level. What is an identity? What is a document? What is an order? If I send you an order, how do I get a receipt? Do I get a tracking number? If I want to cancel the order, can I use my tracking number? So this is on the application, on business process application level. This is what we're, this is what we're talking when we're talking about standardization. And uh, once you have standardization, and by the way, this is not about book production. This is honestly, it's about everything in the world, but it's also about everything in a publishing company. It's about billing, it's about uh, logistics, it's about so and so, it's about all these processes that go in and out of your company. Now, once you have this, this is magic. Now you're fully integrated. Unless you don't have it, you're not, on, you're not really online. If you're communicating with the rest of the world via secretaries and web interfaces, you're not online. Um, the question is, uh, you've, you've heard a lot of, uh, maybe the last two years, everything was blockchain. And if we had met five years ago, everything was big data. And, and of course, none of these things materialize. None of you use a blockchain. None of you have significant big data research. Actually, nobody does. Uh, and, and, and it would be fair to call this, to call this a, just a sort of a stupid hype. But the technology is real, trust me. But it's all... At the end of the day, it's all due to lack of interoperability. How does, how does uh, big data look like? If you look into a large company, large company like DHL probably has 600 databases inside. And you're probably in something like 35 of those databases. So you're here with a little bit of data, and you're here with a little bit of data, and here with a little bit. But we can't bring this together, and if we brought it together, we found that everything has different, uh, different data formats. So that's really too difficult. So what we do is we do, we do a bit of big data over here. But this is tiny big data. This is not big data. Um, so, so big data at the end of the day fails because of lack of interoperability. And, uh, and this year and last year and the next year, you will hear a lot about blockchain. 
And the answer, the question is, if I have a blockchain and you have a blockchain, how do the blockchains communicate? Well, they don't. No, they don't. My secretary will some, send something from my blockchain to your blockchain. I, it's, that's not how blockchain works, but um, in total, I think right now in cryptocurrencies, which is sort of various um, forms of, of blockchain, we'll not go into this, but we have something like 2,000. And the question is, how do these 2,000 communicate with each other? If I have a printing blockchain and you have a logistics blockchain, then probably my printing system needs to talk to you. Uh, yeah, I'd like you to come and meet and we can go and standardize. Now, now if standardize is really this, if, if, if interoperability and standardization on application level is really this big revolution, the next question you ask yourself is, why have I never heard of this? Why is this the first guy to ever tell me? Why is it not, you know, why don't I hear this from the news everywhere? Is this uh, interoperability? And the answer is because, quite frankly, nobody wants it. Because interoperability at the end of the day destroys the two biggest business models we have in the IT industry at the moment, which is SAP and Amazon. SAP, I sell you a highly complicated software for free, and then I ratchet up the yearly, pr the yearly uh, fees. And then you're like, oh, this is getting really expensive. Let me change to a different. And now you realize why I sold you a highly complicated software, because there's no fucking way you can get out of it. So essentially, I established a monopoly in your company, and now I milk you. And at the same time, I'm frustrating the marketplace for all the small and medium vendors which can't sell software into this big, monolithic, highly proprietary system. So if you start standardization, then you can, you can, you can start cutting along the standardized interfaces, take one module out, take someone else's module in, and now A, you don't have vendor lock-in, and B, you've created a big market for a lot of small, medium enterprises to participate in. Or if you are, or if you happen to be a small and medium enterprise, that's what you want, because that's your opportunity to participate um, in, in, a, in an uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, I don't have to explain to you how Amazon works. Um, just uh, imagine for one second that all online shops opened their warehouse system to the outside over an API. So I could see what products you have at what price directly. And I, on my phone, I would have a little software that very quickly, for 100,000 shops, would ask, this backpack at what price? This backpack at what price? And then I ordered the cheapest one. And I never order from Amazon again, because Amazon is always more expensive, because they want uh, whatever, five euros on top. Because this is now, this is interoperability, does not go over a platform, but interoperability goes direct. You and me, because we have the same interface. We can do com business directly. We don't have to go over some intermediary who then charges us 15%, uh, which is sort of, by the way, how colonialism worked. Um, okay, so where do we come from? Um, I'm in IT. Uh, we've, we've studied uh, standardization in the healthcare environment for a long time. Uh, this is uh, IHE, uh, it's uh, Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise, it's a global um, standardization movement. Uh, started globally, uh, so it started with the American Radiology Society asking how you get your x-ray from your radiologist to your GP. Well, you don't, only if I give you a disc and you can carry it from here to there to then find out that they can't read it. So this is the old ways and now that you, uh, just everybody needs to have an interface. Uh, France was very strong, there was very strong groups in Rennes uh, that for 20 years have done this. 20 years, very diligent work. And this is the global system now. This is, this is what you get in Austria, in Switzerland, NHS UK, France of course, uh, America, Canada, Japan is very big in this. Um, this, is how you, this is how in the medical field we exchange data between hospitals uh, and, and other care providers. Um, so how does this work? Basically, we're looking at um, a use case, such as ordering something or um, uh, sending a print, and Michaela will talk about it, sending a print job somewhere. So you look at these use cases and you try to standardize them, try to standardize the communication, and this is what we call, um, this is what we call uh, a profile. Uh, this is, by the way, this is not these base standards. We're not discussing like, we, we, uh, we must all be familiar with Onyx, and we must all be familiar with JDF and other sort of types of uh, data. We're not trying to reinvent this at all. This is, we're not touching this even. The question is, how do you want your Onyx file? I'll send it to you per email, or should I upload it to the FTP server? 
And once I uploaded it to the FTP server, how do I know that you got the correct version, that it's not corrupt? How do I know you're using the, cor the correct version? If, if something went really wrong, how can I cancel what I just sent and resend it? And the answer is you can't, you have to call me. It's like, oh, <laughs> in my publishing company, we have better things to do than call other people about broken Onyx files. So, the, so, so this is interoperability is the question, how do you get your Onyx file from A to B and get a tracking and cancellation number, et cetera, in return? Now, once you have, once you have designed, um, once you have designed sort of the, the profile, and from this profile, you develop your, your standard, and, uh, and then you realize that standardization in IT is actually very easy. You just add data fields just more data fields, and the standard grows sort of like cancer. Well, this guy was different. He wanted other data fields, so we also added them. Uh, and it's, in the end of the day, never works. And if any of you work in IT, what you know, there's a big difference between compatibility and actual compatibility, meaning things work on paper. On paper, you and I are highly compatible. In real life, it never worked. Um, so, so what IHE got right is that if you're proposing such a standard, uh, you have to... Um, uh, provide a reference implementation, and you have to provide a test case, uh, which other people can use to, to check if they are de facto interoperable with, with your... Um, and then they meet once a year, and this is really 400 coders in one room, and if you claim that you can do this profile, then you have to show that you can do this profile in the test case against the reference implementation. And if not, if you fail, it's not a big problem because the guy who set up the original profile is somewhere in the room and he's going to come over and he's going to help you sort out your software until you are de facto interoperable. So this is, this is, the, this is the magic uh, where, where standardization is different from things you just do on, on, on paper. Um, so we've, we've studied this for the past, I don't know, four years I've studied this. Uh, and uh, now, basically, we're trying to look at how to port this to how to port this to other verticals, and publishing being one of them. And uh, so, if you look at these things, there will, there's, there's really, at the end of the day, quite frankly, it boils down to one question. And and the one question that we have is power. Uh, you hear a lot about IT, like this system is nicer than this system because it has more features and blue buttons, meaning sort of like Apple, they just get it right every time. Well, this, you know, our IT systems are not Apple, right? Like, we're talking about B2B communication. It's not sexy, it's not colorful, you can't even see anything. Um, and it's never, ever about technology. It's always about governance. It's the question at who controls the power at the end of the day for setting up this. Imagine you're doing an IT standardization and the standardization is run by your, by your closest competitor. You wouldn't touch it because you would be dependent on the will of your competitors, like, no, I won't touch this. So really, in standardization, the way to set this up is you need to, from the start, balance power. Balance power in a way that you get multiple parties on the table and say, okay, we balance power so, so nobody can screw over the other guy and the other people can join and it will remain a fair, um, a fair system. Now, um, from this sort of what we've derived is this concept of what we would call a minimal viable community. So this is how you standardize. So number one, you can't do it on your own. That's like inventing your own language. It's a bit useless. So you have to do it in a community. You have to do it with other people. How do these other people look like? Um, you, need to have, you need to have multiple people and actually multiple competitors in order to get this governance right. You need to get like the three biggest printing houses. And once they set up something, then that's fair. If it's just one printing house, then that's my own system. Just everybody just look at me, everybody just you give me the money, and it's, it's, it's just not very attractive. Um, by the way, uh, also, if, if things smell of sauerkraut, they're not very attractive to French people, it turns out. Um, so, so then here's the other point. At the end of the day, um, there's one internet. There's one IoT. That's global. There's not a German internet, and next to it there is a French internet, and in between is the German-French internet connector, which, by the way, this is the idea that Germany has with Industrie 4.0, which I'm sure is the least attractive for French people to ever join. Why would you be doing Industrie 4.0? So, so there's, quite frankly, there's one internet. So in one internet, any national initiative must fail. We've tried, it was called BTX, you've tried, it was called Minitel. It doesn't work. 
So, so you, need to, you need to think globally and set up the, the community internationally or globally from the start. Uh, and then you need to have several competitors and you need several steps from the value chain. Actually, we were surprised when we started. We thought, oh, we're the publishers, we talk to the printers. The first thing we got was very, very angry phone calls from the manufacturers of printing machinery. Why are we not invited? And it's like, huh, I thought we talked to the printer and you talked to the manufacturer of the printing and they talked to, them, to you, but, but they also wanted to be on the table. And the next thing, the paper manufacturers turned up and it was like, why are we not invited? So you need sort of like, it's, this is how I picture this. This is uh, the Ark Noah. Is of every type, you need at least two and you need to bring all of them on board and then you have a minimal viable community. And then how we do this, how we did this, and how much we actually got achieved for only one year, this Michaela will tell you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, good morning, and uh, do you hear me? Oh, ah, yeah. Good morning and uh, welcome to my hometown. Um, I would like to give you a brief uh, overview of what had happened so far. And um, exactly one year ago, Alexander held this talk uh, at the conference of the um, publishers' production uh, people. Um, nearly 100 people working for German-speaking publishers. And uh, on the next day, um, we sat on this bench uh, in, the, in the yard, and we were talking about what could that mean interoperability for the publishing sector, um, building an open infrastructure, how could we manage that? And um, today, four years ago, at that point, three years ago, um, we at Ulstein, together with our sister companies at the Bonja German Publishing Houses, we developed, um, or we worked on building an open interface between the printing, uh, between the publishing and the printing systems. And we worked together with two of our biggest printer, GGP, Bertelsmann and CPI, and together with our vendor. And uh, we had to face a lot of problems. We, ha we saw that interoperability is not that easy. We really lo uh, lost a much time um, on that task. And um, this was uh, the moment when Alexander and I thought, yeah, let, let us address this issue to the um, whole industry. Um, and the interface publishers to printer uh, gave us a really um, good example for um, illustrating what interoperability, interoperability could mean. Um, we were invited from the Buch Report um, to give um, an article or uh, yeah, to explain um, how digital infrastructure of the publishing sector could work. And then we were invited on the Frankfurt Book Fair to have a, a talk again. And we um, had 70 people from all steps of the supply chain hearing, what, um, hearing about these ideas. Um, and after that, we had a meeting between 20 people and we were asking, do you think it's worth to work on interoperability on standard interfaces? And all the people we had there, there were people from paper mills, from printing industry, from um, logistic, from warehouses, publishers and so on. They all agreed, yes, we should uh, come together and discuss how we can solve that. Next um, important point was we were invited from Canon to the Future Book Forum and we were able to talk to 300, to an audience of 300 international people from the um, publishing industry. And also there we um, get a lot of uh, attention on uh, the question, how could we manage to make um, the industry becoming open or yeah, standardized? And um, in January uh, this year, we had our kickoff meeting. We were invited from Brill. It's an academic publisher um, uh, located in the Netherlands. And um, more than or nearly 30 people, 30 colleagues from the publishing industry uh, representing uh, 17 um, companies and eight different countries 
came to uh, join our little conference. Um, we had, on two days, we heard a lot of consultants from the IHE, that's what Alexander told you, from the health sector, and they um, gave us more information about the methodology, how to make it come alive, that we have all competitors and um, on the table to talk about or to develop interfaces. Um, in Leiden, we decided to um, set up two working groups. One would wanted to uh, work on the interface to printers, and the other working group wanted to work on the um, interface for the logistics side. But when we came together on the Connectaton in The Hague, they decided to stay together because they, when they discussed, and they, um, yeah, as you see it on the picture on the right, they really um, discussed how can we manage um, to come to these profiles, um, on what do we would like to commit. And when they discussed, um, they understood, okay, we face all the same problems and we want to stay together to, uh, to develop the first profile um, that should be um, launched within a year. Um, in Leiden, that was a very important moment because together we um, uh, wrote down a founding statement. Um, we could share it. It's, um, it's not closed. We, uh, we really would like to forward it to you. And um, as you see on the right, many companies signed this founding statement. And this success story um, goes on because every time we come together and we invite to a next meeting, um, new colleagues, new companies join us um, because they all really understood that it is important to build new processes. But again, um, you probably ask yourself why is interoperability so important for the, also for the publishing sector. And, um, if we think about the idea to have a, a gapless and a lossless and a transparency communication from machine to machine over the complete supply chain, you um, will understand that, for example, um, we have in Germany 70,000 novelties um, a year. And if you uh, imagine, okay, every book plus a reprint, probably we talk about 100,000 printing orders a year that we uh, move between, um, or we set up between publishing house and printers, and you calculate that, okay, one, one printing order needs at least one hour at the, printing, at the publishing house to be set up, and we know five hours on the printer's side to put into their system, we talk about six hours minimum for one printing order to, um, to work on. And if you calculate that and you say, okay, one uh, working hour is uh, about 40 euros, then we talk at least about uh, 24 million euros per year that we just throw out the window. It's no invest into our supply chain. It's just money that we give away and that and every year again. And this is just the number, that just the figure for Germany. So um, thinking about having this money for and also the time we lose um, to build um, new business models or really to um, be able to, inter to, to communicate much more freer in our business um, infrastructure, you probably understand why this issue is very important. Okay, thank you so much for your attention and please let us know if you have any question. Thank you. Hello, thank you for this initiative. Uh, did you ever hear of uh, the same initiative in France called Click Edit? Yeah, we uh, talked to the, um, uh, not to say to the president. We had a phone call. We um, also um, asked him to invite us to France. So this is still um, our 
offer, but um, by now we haven't been invited to Paris, so if you could help us, we would love to. I will. Yeah. Any, any other invitations to France would also be very welcome. Yes, and to other countries, of course. I uh, have another one to ask you if you've heard of... Have you heard of interoperability standards in the U.S. called XBITS? We've been working in the U.S. on this exact problem for 25 years. Yeah, great. No, I, I haven't heard of um, So there is quite an extensive set of standards for printers, publishers, paper manufacturers, price scales, you name it, it's, mm -hmm. it's all done. Um, there are currently just two or three of the largest publishers and two or three of the largest printers mm -hmm. using it in the U.S. right now. All right. So probably we could talk to each other after that. Thank you.